Okay, so lecture six, we're going to keep talking about permutations. So in the last few classes, we've talked about different statistics that we can put on permutations. Uh, number of inversions, number of descents, uh, number of cycles, major index, several different statistics. And we count the permutations according to the statistics. Um, today, our first goal is going to be a little bit different. It's going to concern... Um, something called pattern avoidance. So it goes like this. Let's, let's consider a permutation of length k. and a permutation of length n, where this one is shorter than this one. Okay? So we're going to say that B avoids the pattern U if um, there do not exist indices that say i1 up to ik such that when you look at b i1 up to b ik right, so these are k of these numbers in b they should never have the same order as the numbers in u uh, so there do not exist these guys such that these guys are are in the same order as they use. Okay? So what I mean by that is that whenever you have u of a less than u of b, you also have that b sub i sub a is less than b sub As usual, this is clearer in an example. So, um, so let's say this is B, and let's say this is U. And so I ask you, does this permutation avoid this one? Okay. And so what you're going to do is that you're going to try to find three numbers in this permutation that are in the same order as 2, 3, and 1. So can you find three numbers in this permutation that are in the same order as 2, 3, and 1 here? Yes? Which ones? For example, 5, 6, 4 are in the same order as 2, 3, and 1, right? Middle, big, small. Now, they don't have to be consecutive. For example, 5, 6, 1. are also in the same order as 2, 3, and 1. Or 3, 4, and 1. Or several others. And so we say that this guy contains 2, 3, 1. Okay. Um, so that's the opposite of avoiding. But I claim that, for example, this avoids 3, 2, okay. Because you cannot find three numbers here that are listed in decreasing order from left to right. Okay. You, can, you can just stare at it and you'll see that you cannot find those three numbers. Okay? So that's what it means to avoid a pattern. And so here's a theorem that I want to show. Theorem, the number permutations which avoid 3, 2, 1. Number of 3, 2, 1 avoiding permutations of n 
is given by um, the following thing. Actually, I, rea I realized recently that there's something else that I haven't told you about the way we do enumerative combinatorics. So we can come up with questions like this. And uh, let's say that you want to, yeah, you want to know, OK? What's the number of permutations like this? Okay. So one typical thing that we do in combinatorics is that we say, well, in one nice thing about combinatorics is you can often do the first examples. So you would do n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. Um, and when you do it here, you're going to find that they go 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, 42, etc. Those are the first few values. Okay. Maybe you recognize them, maybe you don't. If you recognize them, then you have something to prove. If you don't recognize them, then you go to this thing called the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So to do that, you Google OEIS, online encyclopedia of integer sequences. I think the, it's maybe OEIS.org, I forget. But anyway, you, you, you go in there, and this is an encyclopedia where you type exactly this. You type 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, 42, enter, and then the encyclopedia will tell you everything that it knows about that sequence. So for example, when it sees this, it's going to tell you these numbers are very well known. They're called the Catalan numbers. And they, it'll tell you that they're given by this formula, 1 over n plus 1. To and and it'll give you pages and pages of references and, and recurrence relations, generating functions, everything that that it knows about that sequence. So these are called Catalan numbers. And so when you get to the point, you realize that you need to learn what Catalan numbers are. Okay. So then you look it up, and then so that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to teach you what Catalan numbers are. Um, so let's go over here. Now, one one thing that I should tell you also is that. The most encyclopedic treatment of Catalan numbers is in the book for this class, Enumerative Combinatorics, Volume 2. If you go to exercise number, what is it, uh, 6.19, you will find an exercise that has about 150 different parts. And each part says, prove that these objects are counted by Catalan. The Catalan numbers appear all over combinatorics and other areas of mathematics. Um, and so this is one place where they appear, is in the enumeration of uh, lattice paths. Okay. So let me make a definition. The Catalan number C sub n is the number of paths from 0, 0 to 2 and comma 0 using steps um, like this. Okay. So 1, 1, or northeast step, or like this. So this is a step in direction 1 minus 1, direction southeast. Um, such that, so it's the number of paths satisfying this, which uh, never cross below the x-axis. Okay. And these kinds of paths are called dike. 
facts. Okay. Actually, I learned from David that the proper way to pronounce this is dyke path, even though people often call them dick paths. Uh, so, okay, so this is the Catalan number, and these are dyke paths, and so what we're gonna do first is just to make sure that we understand, let's do it for n equals three. So you need to go from 0, 0 to 6, 0 using these steps. That means that it's going to take you six steps, okay? And one way to do it is like this. Up, down, up, down, up, down. But you could also go up, down, up, up, down, down. Or you could also go up, up, down, down, up, down. Or up, up, down, up, down, down. Or up, 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 down, down, down. Okay. It's easy to see that there's no other ones. So C3 is equal to 5, which is this 5. So I guess this, this, this wasn't here. Okay. So is it clear what the Catalan number is? So, so let's prove the following thing. Let's prove that the Catalan number satisfy a very nice recurrence. The Catalan number n plus 1 is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n of ck, cn minus k for any n greater than or equal to 0. So to prove this, what we're going to do is that, okay, these are the Catalan, uh, these are the dike paths of length 2 and plus 1. And so let's consider uh, something like this. This is some uh, path of length 2 times n plus 1. Okay? So the, the number of them is equal to this. What I want to show is that the number of them is also equal to this. Okay? So there should be some kind of parameter k that I separate here. So what is k going to be? What I'm going to do is uh, Okay, so we're going to start with a path P. And we're going to assume that it first hits the x-axis at a point here, which is uh, 2 times k plus 1. Okay? Could have said 2k, but it turns out to be a little bit more convenient to call this point k plus 1. Now, of course, that number is even because it's even, right? <laughs> whenever, whenever you are, you take an odd number of steps, you're at an odd height, and whenever you take an even number of steps, you're at an even height. So that means that if you're at the x-axis, then you must have taken an even number of steps, 2 times k plus 1. Okay? So given such a path, I'm going to do the following thing. Okay. So let p, I don't know, let's, let's say that this denotes the dike path, the set of dike paths of length n plus 1. Okay. Uh, hit uh, return to the x-axis. X-axis first at x equals two k plus one. Okay. The worst case scenario is that it never hits except for the end, and in that case, k is going to be equal to n. Okay, so k is well defined. So then I'm going to say the following thing. I'm going to say, okay, well, here's a dike path, and it's a dike path that never hits the x-axis. 
And so let me cut off one height. Okay, so this is at height one. And let me consider what I get here. So what is that? So that's a that's a dike path. Why is it a dike path? Because it never crosses the blue line, because if it crosses the blue line, then the black would hit the x-axis. Okay? So I'm going to call this P1. Okay. And I'm going to call this other stuff P2. Okay. So then what do I get? I get that P1 is a dike path. And how long is it? Well, it's, a, it's exactly like 2K, right? Because this is 2K plus 1, and then I need to subtract these two things. So this is a dike path for K. And P2 is a dike path of length. It goes from K plus 1 to M plus 1. So, C n minus k. And conversely, if I start with any path of length k here and any path of length n minus k here, then I'm going to get a dike path of length n plus 1 through this construction. Okay. So what did I just do? I defined a map from the set of dike paths for n plus 1 to, um, well, there's a dependence on k, right? So actually, k could be anything. From what to what? It could go from the first time that I could hit is at two, right? which is when k is equal to zero, and the last thing that k could be is n. Okay. Uh, so I get a map from here to here. The set of k paths times the set of n minus k paths. So the point is that this gives up bijection like this. For each path here, I get something on the right-hand side, and vice versa, for everything on the right-hand side, for the right value of k, I perform the construction, and I get a path of length n plus 1. So if this is a bijection, that means that these two sets have the same size, but this has size cn plus 1. And here, this is a disjoint union, and for each k, 0 to n, the size of a, of a product of sets is this times this. So that proves the formula. Let's prove the formula. The recurrence formula for Catalan numbers. And this is a very typical trick when you, whenever you try to prove that something is given by Catalan numbers. One very common way to do it is to prove the recurrence. And it very often goes like this. You, you, you take an object of your family, n plus 1, and you naturally decompose it into two objects, one of size k, one of size n minus k. It works here, and it works in almost any Catalan problem. OK, um, okay so. The next thing we're going to do is that we're going to use this recurrence to give a formula for the catalog. Which is the formula that, that uh, appears here. Okay. Now, let me, let me just say that you one thing that you could try to do is say, well, you know, if I'm trying to prove this formula, what I could do is just try to prove it by induction. So just assume that CK is equal to this, CN minus K is equal to this for the appropriate parameters. But when you try to plug in, you're going to find that it's very hard to see why the right-hand side is equal to what it needs to be. Actually, the proof, the proof by induction, you can come up with such a proof, but it's hard. Um, so what we're going to do is different. This is one of those instances where actually 
um, the generating function approach is a little bit easier than the combinatorial approach. At least it doesn't really require doing anything too clever. So, so we're going to follow the generating function approach. Okay, so let's define the generating function for the Catalan numbers. We'll call it C of x. Okay. And the reason to do that is that this should look to you like a convolution of power series. So if I take this thing and I square it, I'm taking this and multiplying it by itself. Okay? So um, how am I going to get an x to the n when I multiply this by itself? Well, an x to the n appears when I take ck x to the k and I multiply it by cn minus k x to the n minus k. For each value of k from 0 to n. These are the ways of getting an x to the n. You need to choose a power x to the k in the first copy of c of x. In the second one, you need a power of x to the n minus k to get this. And so that's why you get this. Which is great. I mean, and, and I should say, this is the standard convolution uh, formula for multiplying power series. But this is great because this is exactly what we have here. Okay. So what we get is sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c n plus 1 x to the n. Okay. Now, I want to point out that this is a very remarkable formula. And let me write it down like this so that you're more impressed. What I'm saying is that if you take this power series and you square it, what you're going to get is this power series. So it's the same power series except that it's just shifted over by 1. That's a very special property. And, and I should say that this property is equivalent to that recurrence. So, I could state those recurrence of saying my power series satisfies this property. Now, I can, I can do the following thing. Let me multiply both sides by x. Okay, so c of x squared is equal to this, and now let me multiply by x. So I get this. Okay? And the reason to do that is that now. What is this? This is c1x to the 1 plus c2x squared, etc. This is the same series as before, except that it's missing the first term. This one starts at, at c1x to the 1. It's missing the first term, and the first term is 1. Okay. The first catalan number is 1 because you're looking at paths from 0, 0 to 0, 0. And there's only one path, which is the trivial path. Okay. So again, this recurrence actually reads very beautifully in terms of the generating function. It's just a quadratic equation, and we know how to solve quadratic equations. Um, so and when we do this, we multiply by 4x, right? So we get 4x squared c of x squared equals 4x c of x minus 4x, OK? And the reason I do that is to, is to not be able to complete the square, OK? So I almost have a square here, except uh, let me let me say here minus one plus one because now when I do this minus this plus this that's a square. This is exactly the square one minus two x c of x. This is what I get when I bring all of these together. And this is going to be equal to one minus four. So, 
Actually, this this means that I can I can solve for c of x. Right? What I get is that one minus two x c of x is equal to the square root of one minus four x, which is this. Right? And that means that I I found c of x, and now I just need to find the the coefficients. Right? And so I just need to, I just need to tell you what are the coefficients of this thing. But I know how to deal with something like this because this is just a, a binomial theorem, right? This is 1 plus something to a power. And so the binomial theorem tells us that this is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to infinity of 1 half choose k minus 4x to the k. Okay? This is the, this is the binomial theorem. Um, and now I need your help because there's many places where I can make mistakes from now on. So don't let me make any mistakes. But what's the point? The point is that now I'm going to find the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 here. Is. So what's the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 on the left-hand side? Well, if I want to get an x to the n plus 1 here, then the, the 1 is irrelevant. That's not going to contribute x to the n plus 1. And here I have x, which means that I should choose an x to the n here. Okay. What's the coefficient of x to the n here? It's the nth Catalan number. And so what I get is minus 2 times the nth Catalan number. What is it on the right-hand side? Well, I need to make k equals n plus 1. And so I get 1 half choose n plus 1 and then minus 4 to the plus 1. Okay. So there's my, form there's my formula for Catalan numbers. OK, it's a formula, but that's not the formula we're hoping for. We're hoping for a much nicer formula. And so this is where what I need to do is that I need to transform this formula into that. Okay. And this is not hard, but it requires us to be very careful. So this is where I need your help. So remember, what is a real number choose an integer? We know that that's r choose n plus 1 is r times r minus 1, r minus 2, <coughs> etc., up to r minus n. And I go to minus n so that I have 0, 1, 2, up to n. I have n plus 1 terms here, which is what I should have in something choose n plus 1. This divided by n plus 1 factorial. That's the definition of 1 half choose n plus 1. And I still have that minus 4 to the n plus 1. OK? So let's continue. Um, I'm going to. You see, all of these are, the, are fractions with denominator 2. So I'm going to take all the 2's to the bottom. And what are the numerators? I get 1 half, then I get a half minus 1 is minus 1 half, a half minus 2 is minus 3 halves, a half minus 3 is minus 5 halves, up to a half minus n is minus 2n minus 1 halves. So these are my numerators, and the denominators are a bunch of 2's. How many 2's? Well, there's n plus 1 terms here, so 2 plus 1, 2 to the n plus 1, thanks. And I still have my minus 4 to the n plus 1. So again, don't let me make any mistakes. I've told you that, that this is on the notes, so you don't really need to write this down. The most important thing is that we don't make mistakes here. So let's continue. So we get minus 2 cn equals. How many minus signs do I have here? 
here I have, remember here I have n plus one terms, and one is positive, the rest are negative. So the number of minus signs is minus one to the n from here, and then minus one to the n plus one. That's good because that's a minus sign, and this is a minus sign. So the, so the signs are going to match up. Okay, we double the signs. Now, here we have 4 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. So let's take that out so it doesn't get in our way. Actually, I'm just going to take this thing and put a minus. We agree that the signs match, and they just get rid of this minus. So let's forget about the signs. Now, 4 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 is 2 to the n plus 1. This n plus 1 factorial is still here. And now what I have is this 1 times 3 times 5 times dot 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 times 2n minus 1. Okay? Which is almost a factorial, except that it only has half of the terms. It's missing all the odd, all the even terms. Okay, so to make to make it a factorial, let's put them in. Okay, so let's put two, four, six up to two n. But of course, to do that, I need to also put them in the denominator. Okay. So what am I going to get now? Well, the numerator is just two n. What, what is this denominator? Well, it's, it's the other half, but this half is much better than this half because here the 2's factor out. Right? Here I have 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 2 times n, which means that I have n 2's and then I get 1 times 2 times 3 n, which is n factorial. So that's great. That, me I mean, this, that means that this is harder to deal with, this is easier to deal with. And so I took this thing, and I got this, and then 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. This is 2 times the Catalan number. Okay, so we're getting closer. Now we see 2 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n is 2 which is this 2, so what we get is that cn is equal to 2n factorial over n factorial n plus 1 factorial. This must be the right thing. In order to make it to look like this, let me just take this n plus 1 factorial and write it as... So I take this guy out and I just put 1 over n plus 1 and then I put n factorial n plus 1 times n factorial, it's n plus 1 factorial, and this is 2n choose n. Oh. Alright, any questions about that proof? So this is this kind of magic that uh, generating functions let you get away with. I would argue that we still have no idea why the Catalan numbers are equal to this, but we have a proof. Having a proof is better than not having a proof. Um, so those are the Catalan numbers. Now, I wanted to do this computation without discussing some technical details that I'm kind of sweeping under the carpet and hiding from you. And so what I want you to do now, I mean, after we're finished, and is look at that computation again and see if, like we say in Colombia, I tried to score a goal on you without letting you see it. Uh, is there anything there that is not entirely justified? Um, I took some square roots. Take a, 
I raised something to the one half. That's that's a reason to worry. Uh, I never talked about convergence. I told you that I wouldn't in this class, but I told you that these computations all take place in the in the ring of formal power series, and I was fairly liberal about what I did in this computation. So what I want you to do is now look at that computation again and justify each step and make sure that you understand what each step means and why there's no lies. I mean, this computation really works, but there's a couple of issues that we should discuss in the forum of, of why we didn't use convergence and that's fine, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, now, I want to I wanna just say one thing. So, I'm going to tell you a, a true story. When, when I was in, when I was in in middle school, I guess is what you call it. When I was in middle school, uh, our physical education teacher had a rule that if if we were ever walking around the school and we saw a soccer ball and we walked by a soccer ball and we didn't kick it, he was going to fail us for the year. Because this is the wrong instinct. If you see a soccer ball, you kick it. Okay. And so now, I, I mean, this is really very deeply ingrained in me. I, if I see a soccer ball, I need to do something. With it. Step on it, something. Uh, in combinatorics, when you see a formula like this, you cannot be satisfied with this proof that I just gave you. And I hope you're not. It's a nice proof. It's, it's cool, it's fun. But it does not explain what this is about. It really doesn't. This begs for a better explanation. And so I want you to have the instinct that if you see an answer like this, you should not be satisfied. You should try to push it a step further. So what a combinatorialist does, a combinatorialist says, well, you know, I know what two inches n means. I know what dividing means. So I should find a better explanation. Okay. And so I should say that there's at least two combinatorial proofs. Of this fact. One is the following. How many paths are there from 0, 0 to 2n, 0, using these steps up and down? Total. Not, not the ones that stay above the axis, but just total. Well, you know you need 2n steps to get from 0, 0 to 2n, 0. And if you want to end up at height zero, then you better take n steps up, n steps down, in some order. Okay. So that means that out of the two n steps that you take, n should be up, n should be down. This is if I relax the condition of, of crossing the x axis. Okay. So what this is saying is that the probability that you don't cross the x axis is 1 over n plus 1. So exactly 1. This fraction, 1 over n plus 1, 1, <laughs> one over n plus 1 fraction of them are dike paths. And so one way of proving this is to consider all the paths and group them into families of n plus 1 paths in each family such that in each family exactly one is dike and the other ones are not. So that's one possible proof of this. Okay. And there's another possible proof of this, which is to say that instead of counting the dike paths, let's count the paths that are not dike. So in other words, what do I need to put here to get all the paths? So these are the type paths, and these are the ones that are not type. Well, the question is not very interesting. The answer is just this minus this. But the point is that that simplifies. 2, 2n choose n minus 
We said that it is very easy to show. You just plug in and, and, and you'll see that it's true. The reason it's interesting is that the difficulty in proving this formula for the Catalan numbers, the main difficulty is that fraction. Actually, you're struggling with that in your homework as we speak. You have a fraction that you don't know what to do with. It's, it's, it's a little bit trickier to deal with fractions and combinatorial interpretations. So instead of proving that these are the dike paths, you could prove that these are the not dike paths, and the point is that this answer is nice. Which means that actually there's an easier proof that the number of not dike paths is this. That doesn't mean that it's very easy, but it's a little bit easy. I mean, you, can, you, you think about it for a while, and, and there's a nice trick to show that this is the number of not dike paths. And by proving that, you get the formula. So these are two kinds of things that you can do to prove. All right. So, having done that, I introduced Catalan numbers to you. I proved the formula to you. But we still haven't come any closer to proving the theorem that we meant to prove. Which is that the number of 3 to 1 avoiding permutations is Catalan. So, let's talk about why that's true. So, so to prove this, there's, there's several ways. And as I told you, one way, and it's a way which you can make work, is just to prove that these numbers satisfy the Catalan recurrence. Okay, so you could take a 3 to 1 avoiding permutation of length n plus 1 and somehow find a way of separating it into 1 of length k, 1 of length n minus k, and prove the recurrence. So that's something that you could try to do. But I would argue that a nicer proof would be to just give up ejection with dike paths, which we already proved are given by these things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to prove the theorem. by giving a bijection. So we need a bijection. We want a bijection from the 3, 2, 1 avoiding permutations of n to the dike paths of length to it. Okay. Now, these bijections always have some ingredient of cleverness. Uh, you get better with bijections as you practice with them. But let's make some general comments about this before we start. One. One thing that's tricky about finding this bijection is that these things seem quite different from each other. Permutations are quite different from dike paths. Okay. Now, you might say, OK, well, permutations, we already have several ways of thinking about them. One way is to say a permutation is just a word. It's just a, some word of n different letters. What is a dike path? A path is something that wants to live on a grid. Right? So this, this lives on a grid. Yeah. I'm, being, I'm being very uh, non-rigorous here, but I want to. It's good to be non-rigorous sometimes and just talk a little bit about the, lo the logic behind this. Dike paths want to live on a grid. These things want to live on a line the way that we usually think about them, right? Permutations are on a line, dike paths are on a grid. Um, there's other ways of thinking about permutations. For example, we have cycle notation. Cycle, cycle notation is also kind of on a line. We also have this diagram notation, right, where you just draw the cycles as a little graph. So then you could think, okay, these guys live as graphs, but also graphs are not so similar to grids. 
And so one thing that you might try to do is you might try to say, okay, well, how can I try to represent a permutation inside a grid so that I can come a little bit closer to the grids that I'm looking for? So can you think of permutations living inside a square grid in some sense? Are there any other ways of writing permutations that you remember from your years of thinking about permutations? But I'll come wiring that again. So you took a class with me on Coxeter groups a long time ago, and we talked about how permutations can also be given in terms of wiring diagrams, uh, which uh, might be a way of doing this. I don't know a way that goes through wiring diagrams, but it, but it, there are diagrams that go through kind of a they're kind of like grid-like diagrams with wires crossing like this. I should say that a wiring diagram is not a diagram for a permutation, but for a factorization of a permutation. So, that, so it's, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, there might be a proof through wiring diagrams, but I don't know one. What are other ways of writing a permutation? So you learn this in, in group theory, uh, that the permutation group is a subgroup of the group of matrices. Each permutation can be represented by a matrix. Remember? It's been a while, probably. Uh, but each permutation can be represented by a matrix in a very natural way. So if I have a permutation, let me just use the same example that I used here. 2, 4, 5, 1, 7, 3, 6, 8. Then you represent this by a matrix. And what you do is that you say, I put two, four, five, one, seven, three, six, eight. Okay. So here you do i, here you do pi of i. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if i is 5, pi of i is 7, and so you put in 1 in entry 5, comma 7. Even if you don't remember this, this is a very clear bijection, right? You, you, you put these guys and just put 1s and zeros in this table according to this rule. Okay? The reason that we do this in group theory is that the composition of permutations corresponds to the multiplication of matrices. And so if you want to do a little bit of group theory here, then this is a very useful transformation. But we're not doing group theory at this moment. We're, we're just enumerating. And so we don't need to worry about this. And in particular, we don't really need to, need to think of this as a matrix. We can think of it as a table. Matrix are, are kind of tables. Um, so I'm just going to do this and just write it as a table. OK, so forget this is a matrix, and let me just write it as a table, an A by A table. Okay. Let me try to draw a reasonable table here. So you can see why all my permutations have like eight today. Drawing eight by eight boards is a little bit easier. So, so what I do is that I say in the first row, I put an x at two. Then I put an x here at four. Then at five. Then at one. Then at seven. Then at three. And at six and at eight. Okay. So same thing. I put an x at i comma pi of i. Okay. So this is a way of representing these guys in tables, and the and the property that these tables have, because these are permutations, 
is that there is exactly one x in each row and exactly one x in each column. If that's true, that comes from permutation. One x in each row and one in each column. Okay. So that's a table representation of a permutation. And so now my permutations live on a grid. Okay. This is, for a lot of purposes, is a very wasteful representation, but now it's useful to us because it's on a grid. I should say, by the way, that this also starts what's called rook theory. If you think of these one, each one of these x's as a rook, which in Spanish is torre, chess rook, and so these are uh, rooks that attack their row and their column. Okay. And so what we're doing is that we're putting n rooks so that they don't attack each other. Actually, there's a section in the book about exactly this question of rook theory when the board is not rectangular but uh, of a different shape. Okay. okay, so from a permutation, I get a picture, but now I need a dike path. So can you see a dike path here? And very often, the, this, 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 this is a step of like, I don't know, artistry, aesthetics, I don't know. You, you just need to somehow dream up a dike path that is compatible with what I just did. Uh, do, you, do you see one jumping at you? If I force you to draw a dike path here, where would you draw it? But it should somehow take the axis into account. It should take the axis into account. <laughs> It's a very big task, of course. It should be bijected, but we don't know ahead of time what's going to be bijected. So if you split the board in half, and if the x is above this median, then the things go up. If it's below this median, then it goes down. I'm not sure that I, that I understand exactly what you're, what you're waving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's many things you could try. And actually, there might be several things that you try that give you proofs of this fact. I'm going to show you one. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to walk from here to here. And, uh, okay, well, that puts some restrictions. Now, what walk am I going to take? Again, I have several options. But one walk that I'm going to take is kind of the, the lowest walk that I can take that contains all the x's under it. Somehow I'm thinking of this as low, this as high, and I'm trying to, to make the, the walk of the lowest height that contains all the x's. Okay. So, if, let's see what notation did I use here. Uh, so I'm going to let e of w be the, the lowest walk from the north west corner to the southeast corner, which contains all x's below. Okay. So what is it in this case? Well. If I'm going to contain this x, then I need to go around it. And then I, I'm, I go down as far as I am able to. But if I want to contain this x, then I need to make a right here. Okay. And then I can go down. If I want to contain this x, I need to go over here. And I can go down. How far? Well, I can go to here. But now to contain this x, I need to go over here. And now let me go down. And now to contain this x, I need to go So that's it. I wish that I could see the video to see if this is showing, but I think I made it thick enough that it's showing. This is my path. Is it clear how I'm defining it? Now, 
I can also say a little bit more about it. Uh, I can say exactly what the corners of this path are. The corners of the path correspond to the x's that are northeast most. Right? Whenever you have an x that has other, other x's northeast of it, it doesn't really influence the path. But the ones that have no x's northeast of it are the corners of this walk. So that's how I define the walk. OK, so we still have a lot of things to say. For example, one thing that we still don't know, I mean, this is some walk, but is it a dike path or not? Now, of course, you, you should tilt your head 45 degrees, right? So is there a dike path with respect to this diagonal? Okay. Uh, this, this one stays above the diagonal, but the question is, do they always? And the first thing that we want to show is that this is a dike path. So let me show that to you. So proof, assume otherwise. Assume that it's not. So if it's not, what does that look like? That means that it crosses the diagonal, right? So let me draw the diagonal here. Okay. Kind of OCD. I can't really put up with this task here. Draw a better one. You'll forgive me. Okay, that's a little bit more square. So let's assume that our path went like this, and then like this, and then maybe it crossed. And we're going to reach a contradiction. Okay. So let's say that it crossed right here. And maybe who knows what it did. It doesn't matter what it did later. Okay. Let's say that it crossed at um, k. So let's assume that this right here is k and k. That's where it comes to. Okay. Um, now let me go one lower, because it really did cross. Okay, so let me draw a horizontal line here. One lower. Okay, so this is at k plus one. And let me just draw this like this. Okay. So now I want to consider what's under the path, but I, I want to split it into three regions. So this region I'm going to call A, okay? Then this region I'm going to call B. And then this region over here I'm going to call C. These are the three regions under my dike path. Okay. So, and what I want is the, these numbers represent the number of x's that I have in each region. Okay, so should I be writing in black? So let's say that there's A x's in this region, there's b x's in this region, and there's c x's in this region. So that means that a plus b plus c is what? a plus b plus c is the total number of x's, which is n. Right? But now, how big can a plus c be? Well, the cells of A, a and C are among the first K columns, and they cannot attack each other, which means that I have at most K. Now, what about B plus C? The cells of B plus C are in the last rows. How many rows do I have here? From K plus 1 to N, I have 
and minus k minus 1. So I have n minus, one, n minus k minus 1 rows among b and c, and these x's cannot attack each other. They cannot be, they all have to be in different rows, and so the number of them is at most this. Okay? So what happens when I add here? I get that a plus b plus 2c, is that's going to equal to n minus 1. But a plus b plus 2c is bigger than this, or bigger than or equal to this, which is my contradiction. So this is a dike path. Can you remind me when I should end? 25 after. 25 after. Oh, did you want numbers, like minutes? No, that's good. <laughs> so I have like 10 minutes. OK, so for any permutation, I just proved that I do get a tag path. Okay. But somehow I want a bijection from 3 to 1 avoiding permutations to tag paths. So what's the most optimistic thing that you can hope? Well, you can hope that when you restrict this bijection to those permutations, it actually, sorry, when you restrict this map to those kinds of permutations, it is a bijection. Okay. So so from W to P of W, this always works. Now, what I want to show is that this is a bijection And I restrict it to 3 to 1 avoiding permutations. So what I want to do is that I want to construct the inverse of this map. So, um, so my, my claim now is that P is a bijection from 3 to 1 avoiding. There was this normal permutation, so you're saying that it wouldn't be one on one? So what I'm saying is that actually, if you don't restrict to these permutations, then there are several permutations that give you the same dike path. Can you come up with an example? Switch the first. I could switch these two axes to be like this. Mm -hmm. It's a different permutation that has the same dike path. So that's why this is not a bijection, but when I restrict it to 3 to 1 avoiding, then it's going to be a bijection. Okay. And so to do this, we construct the inverse. Here's the proof. We construct the inverse. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the path. Square path, right? square board, and now I'm supposed to take that path and recover the permutation. So So that's my path, and now I want to reconstruct W. So what should I do? Well, the first thing is clear, right? Um, if this is going to be the path, then I need to put X's at these spots. So I first put X's at the northeast corners. And then what do, I, what do I have left to do? Well, what I have to do is now look at how to fill out the rest of the board. 
I need to fill out this row. But this, let me just consider the subgrid of rows and columns that I haven't considered yet, that I haven't filled up yet. So I need to do this and uh, this. And this. So these are the only places where I can put X's now. So the other X's need to go in the remaining K by K grid. Okay? The blue grid that I have there. Um, and I want to avoid the pattern 3 to 1. How does the pattern 3 to 1 look in terms of axis? It means biggest, medium, smallest. I shouldn't have three axes that are that are northeast of each other like this. So how do I how do I do that? The point is that there should be a unique way. So what's the way? Um, what I'm gonna do is that I'm just gonna take that and well, if I'm trying to avoid this, maybe I should try to do the opposite. I mean, if I didn't have to avoid 3 to 1, I could choose any permutation for the blue table. But if I'm trying to avoid this, maybe I should just go in the other direction. So let me just go through this, down, down this main bag. So I'm going to put the axis, put k-axis down the main bag. Why is the result 3, 2, 1 avoiding? Because the green axes are in this direction, the blue axes are in this direction, and whenever you have three axes, two of them have to be of the same color, either green or blue. If, the, if there's two green ones, then they're in this direction. If there's two blue ones, they're in this direction. That's why this thing is 3, 2, 1 avoiding. And conversely, it's it's pretty easy to see that if I do not make this choice, if I don't go down the main diagonal, but I but I chose two axes that face like this, like these guys, if I take these two axes and I switch them like this, then this one, this one, I just look for the next x northeast, and that's gonna be a three to one path. So that there's a unique choice that makes this three to one avoiding, which proves uh, the theorem that I erased. But the number of 3 to 1 avoiding permutations is together. OK. Um, let me let me just state a fact. And this is going to be in your homework, in your following homework. I'm going to prove this. OK, so we, we just proved that there are C and um, 3, 2, 1 avoiding permutations of K. But you might ask, what's so interesting about 3, 2, 1? Why don't I choose a different permutation? Why don't I choose 3, 1, 2? Or 2, 3, 1? Or 2, 1, 3? Or 1, 3, 2? Or 1, 2, 3? Okay? There are six enumerated problems. What is the number of permutations that avoid n? Sorry, that avoid this pattern and are of length n? What are the answers to these questions? Always the same. 
At this point, you might be wondering if this is trivial or extremely interesting. And I would say that it's somewhat trivial and somewhat extremely interesting. So, for example, it's very easy to show that if there's, if there's three to one avoiding permutations that are counted by the Catalan numbers, then the one to three avoiding permutations are counted by the Catalan numbers. How do you show that? Well, if a board avoids three to one, when you flip it over, it avoids one, two, three. That's a proof. So if this is true, then this is almost trivially true. Okay? But those do not imply the other ones, and the other ones are so it is, it is remarkable that these are the same answer. And in fact, this only happens in length 3 and in, in length 2 trivially. Okay? But if you look at the, at the patterns of length 4, then it's not true that you get the same answer each time. But somehow 3 is a sweet spot where all of these six enumerative problems have the same answer, which is the Catalan number. Um, in the notes, I have a little bit of a hint of how to proceed. And this will be your, one of your homework problems for, for the next class. Question? Will proving one of the other ones, like say 312, will that give us the same reasoning as far as 213? Flip it. So the, the question is given that these two are kind of the same fact, is it also true that if I prove one of them, maybe that implies another one? Probably. Does it imply all of them? Maybe. You have to, you have to think about it. You, you'll be able to answer this question beautifully by the time you turn in the next homework problem. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the theory of pattern avoidance. So this is a very, very rich theory. There's people whose careers are this. There's a conference every year called Permutation Patterns, which is about this. So it's a, it's a big field. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of, of uh, what it looks like. Okay. So yeah, let's stop there. <laughs>